Second Kings chapter 11 is where we left off last time. End of chapter 10, we pick it up in chapter 11 tonight. Jehu had been raised up by the Lord and anointed by the Lord to bring uh, to an end the reign of Joram in the northern kingdom of Israel and also to fulfill the prophecy that God had spoken concerning the descendants of Ahab, and that was because of their failure to repent that there would not be a single male left of the entire household. And then, as Jehu was involved in that task, there was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, Ahaziah, who got involved in a a relationship that wasn't wise with the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, and he was a grandson of Ahab. And so uh, Jehu went ahead and took his life too. And so Jehu takes over the as king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And then concerning the southern kingdom of Judah where Ahaziah has died, uh, we pick it up and see what kind of a power play occurred as it related to taking over that particular uh, reign here at the beginning of chapter 11. Just a terrible, terrible, pathetic period of history in the nation of Israel. They are unrecognizable from what God had called them to be, had intended them to be, and what they even were under David and the pinnacle of of their history, now having given themselves, for the most part, northern and southern kingdom, both to idolatry and disobedience to the Lord. And when uh, Athaliah, the uh, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, uh, Athaliah was uh, a daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, had married into the royal family of the southern kingdom of, of Judah. And so when she saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all of the royal heirs, killed all of her grandchildren, didn't want any uh, competition for the, the uh, throne. And she takes the throne by killing every person that is competition to her. Uh, you know, the, uh, a country is very much out of control when it's in, in that kind of place in its leadership. And so she destroyed uh, her grandchildren and also the children that had been produced by, uh, no doubt, concubines and, and others. But uh, Jehoshaphat, who was also uh, a, a, a descendant of the relationship, the marriage between Ahab and Jezebel, shows us that it doesn't have to always, you know, the, the children don't have to follow the fathers. The daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered, and they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah so that he was not killed. Now, she is the wife of the high priest at that particular point in time. The high priest is Jehoiada, who we're going to get to in verse 4. And so they take this young boy. He's uh, just a year old. And somehow they snatch him away from the rest of the family. He goes undetected in the slaughter. And they raise him in the temple. They hide him there and save his life in, in doing that. I'll tell you, it's so important for... Every Athaliah that there is, every wicked woman, every, you know, wicked grandmother. I mean, that's as bad as it gets is when you got a wicked grandmother. But for every one of them, there's also a Jehoshaphat who needs to rise up and do what she's been called to do and be in the midst of that scene and do the, the good that she's been called to. We can't change everything in this world. No one of us can change everything. The key is is to do the good that we've been called to do. To do the good that we can 
in the sphere of influence that we've been given and where God has placed us. And we never know how big the stakes are that we be faithful to God's call upon our lives and the ministry that He's called us to. This boy that she hides, when she hides him, he is the lone descendant of David. The entire lineage from David to the Messiah is down to one strand at this moment. When God had spoken to David and said, there shall not cease to be of of your lineage one to sit on the throne. Right now with the slaughter of all of these grandchildren, they're down to one single human being from the promises of God being fulfilled. And the interesting thing is when they hide this boy for six years, for six years, nobody but this woman and her husband knows that God's Word is true because for six years it looks like His Word has failed. His promise concerning the Messiah being a descendant of David, it looks like What this one wicked woman has done has caused that very promise for the first time in man's history for a promise of God to fall to the ground and to fail. And for six years it looks like God's Word has failed. And it's going to only be in the seventh year that it's going to be revealed to be absolutely true. I'll tell you, we live in a day and we live in times and in our own individual lives where it can seem as if the promises of God are, have failed in my life. Listen, it's going to either be six days or six weeks or six years, but it will be some period of time where it is ultimately revealed that His Word has not failed as it relates to His promises to mankind and His promises to us individually. And so this child is taken underground, and this child is raised for six years in the temple. And in the seventh year, Jehoiada, who was the priest, he sent and he brought the captains of the hundreds of the bodyguards and the escorts, and he brought them to the house of the Lord to him. In other words, he takes all of these the rulers uh, over the bodyguards and the military of this evil woman, and he, he brings those captains, he brings those rulers over the hundreds to him to now reveal to them what God has done in the saving of this boy's life. He's a wise man. He knows that what needs to happen for the nation is that somehow this woman be removed and this boy be put in his appointed place. But he doesn't want a needless carnage He doesn't want a war to break out where more people are harmed than is necessary. And so he calls them. The only one that needs to be removed is this woman. And so he calls them to him, and he made a covenant with them and took an oath from them in the house of the Lord, and no doubt saying, listen, I'm going to show you something, and you have to make a covenant with me that you're going to stay faithful to God's promises and not to the rule of this woman And so he takes an oath from them and the house of the Lord, and then he showed them the king's son. I'll tell you, evil always overlooks something. And what it always overlooks ultimately brings it crashing down. This woman, on the day in which they're going to bring forth this plan, She figures she's been reigning for six years. Evil has won. It's prospered. And so she wakes up that morning just like every other morning of those six years. Got away with it. Did it. Such a great plan. Such a, you know, masterpiece of genius. The, 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 you know, the perfect crime. Got away with it. I tell you, evil will never prosper. They always overlook something that sooner or later, is going to jump to the forefront and then the one who is involved in wickedness is going to be defeated. 
And so he commanded them, saying, This is what you shall do. One third of you shall come on duty on the Sabbath, shall be, uh, uh, one third of you who come on duty on the Sabbath shall be keeping watch over the king's house. Do what you usually do. One third shall be at the gate of Sir, and one third at the gate behind the escorts. And you shall keep a watch of the house, lest it be broken down. And two contingents of you who go off duty on the Sabbath shall keep a watch of the house of the Lord for the king. He's setting up a guard around the king so that nothing happens to the king. He's preparing for everything. But you shall surround the king on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hands, and whoever comes within range, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king as he goes out and as he comes in. And so the captains of the hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada the, high, the, pri, the priest commanded. Each one of them took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath. And they came to Jehoiada the priest. And the priest gave the captains of hundreds the spears and the shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of the Lord. And then the escort stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, all around the king from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple by the altar and the temple. So you can kind of picture there in the temple, here is the king, this seven-year-old boy in there, and he is surrounded by these valiant men, all of them armed, all with their weapons pointed out, and no one is going to get to that king. And that's the scene that this grandmother is faced with when when she comes into the middle of it. And he brought uh, out the king's son as they are prepared now to receive him. And Jehoiada put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. This priest, even in the midst of this wickedness, oh, he rises above the wickedness of the day and the hour in which he lives. And he takes and he realizes that from the book of Deuteronomy, God had called that whenever a a new king would enter into his responsibilities as king and follow his father in that that, uh, office, that what he was to be given was a copy of the law and then be read that law. And so here is Jehoiada the priest, and he takes and he gives this young boy a copy of the law, and then he's going to disciple this young boy. In, in the things of the Lord and these, you know, these years that are so, you know, given to that kind of input. And they made him king and they anointed him and they clapped their hands and everybody began to yell, long live the king. Now, when Athaliah uh, heard the noise of the escorts and the people and all of this noise that's going on, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, there was the king standing by a pillar according to the to custom. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. And all of the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. And then Athaliah tore her clothes and she cried out, treason, treason. <laughs> a lot of nerve. Traitors, traitors. I mean, how can a woman like that, you know, denounce the wickedness or call this wickedness at all after what it is that she's done? It's the, you know, the old saying that talks about, you know, what nerve is, and that is, uh, you know, someone killing their parents and then throwing themselves on the mercy of the court as an orphan. That's the kind of thing that she does here. Is I mean, there's no place for mercy for her at all. But she cries out treason. And then Jehoiada the priest commanded the commanders, the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the army, and said to them, take her outside under guard and slay her with the sword, whoever follows her. And so there is the capital punishment of the Mosaic law. She had murdered, and so her life was to be taken to cleanse the the land of the shedding of innocent blood. And we won't even get into the innocent blood that covers our nation. For the priest had said, do not let her be killed in the house of the Lord. And so they seized her, and she went by way of the horse's entrance to the king's house, and there she was killed. And then Jehoiada 
made a covenant between the Lord. There's a spiritual reformation that occurs now in the southern kingdom of Judah. Remember, the northern kingdom of Israel never had a single good king in their, in their, their entire history. And they're going to be the first kingdom to fall to the Assyrians. Really, not in too many more chapters. Southern kingdom of Judah, they fell later to the Babylonians. They intermittently had good kings. And so this king was a good king as long as he was under the influence of the priest. And so Jehoiada the priest, he made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they should be the Lord's people. And also between the king and the And the people. And so there's a heart commitment of the people. Hey, this is nutty what's going on around us. We are the Lord's people. Let's get back to that. We're the Lord's people. And so they make that covenant. And that kind of a covenant is going to express itself in action. And all of the people of the land went to the temple of Baal, tore it down. They thoroughly broke in pieces its altars and images and and killed Matan the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. The worship of Baal, the god Baal, was simply the deification of nature. It was the deification of the intellect. It was the worship of creation rather than the worship of the Creator. And that's what the northern kingdom of Israel was involved in. That was what the southern kingdom of Israel was involved in. And lest we think that the apostasy of those two kingdoms so many thousands of years ago has nothing to do with the body of Christ today or with us in this room today, the great question that the the passage asks us is, what is the master passion of my life? Is the Lord the master passion of my life. Is he what I live for? Is he the one that I live for? Is he the one? Is he the one that I think about? Is he the reason that I draw my breath to serve him, to worship him, to walk with him? Or is it some thing? Or is it some relationship? Or is it some human being? Or is it sex? Or is it any number, anything created, anything created, drug, alcohol, all of these things that we're so familiar with. We sit here tonight, and Jesus said concerning his zeal for the Father, he said, I do always those things that please the Father. He says, my meat is to do the will of the Father. That's my food. That's what sustains me. That's why I'm still around. That's the only thing that's important to me. That was all that he cared about. I, somebody walked out, so there's a disturbance on it. And this is a serious issue. The great apostle Paul himself said concerning all of this, he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And, and the passage searches my life that way. What is the master passion of my life. Is it the Lord or is it something created? And if it's something created, then I'm a Baal worshiper. That's all there is to it. And so this is much closer to home than, than we give it credit for uh, so often. And so there was to be the destruction of this temple of Baal. And we aren't free to kill the priests of some temple in our community. This is a different covenant that we're reading about. But we're free to kill the priests of something that rises up and exalts itself against the knowledge of God in my own heart. Where I look at it and say, Lord, that's of my own old life. That's the old way. That's not of me anymore. I don't want anything to do with it. You're the master passion of my life. And anything that competes with you in my life, I slay it with the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. I'm not going to go back under those things. The worship of Baal goes on in the hearts of not only multitudes within the world, but multitudes who call themselves Christians. And there needs to be a commitment made and a turning from that and a tearing down of 
those kinds of altars that get built into our life. And then he took the captains of the hundreds, the bodyguards, the escorts, and all of the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord and went by way of the gate of the escorts to the king's house, and he sat on the throne of the kings. And so all of the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet, for they had slain Athaliah with the sword in the king's house. That's the result of that covenant with God. Lord, we're turning back to you with all of my heart. I'm turning back to you, taking these things of evil, these voices that have had such tremendous influence in my life, whether they're in the form of video or CD or in the form of person to person or book or whatever the form, it's removed now from my life, Lord, and the result of the removal of that wickedness and the Lord having his place among his people is that they rejoiced and the city was quiet with the tearing down of that evil. And Jehoash was seven years old when he became king. Well, that's pretty young to be a king. And and yet he's fortunate because he has a priest that cares about him and is going to train up him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. In chapter 12, in the seventh year of Jehu, uh, Jehoash became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Ziba of Beersheba, or uh, Zibia of Beersheba. And Jehoash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all of the days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. That's the encapsulation of his life. He began to reign at seven. He reigned for 40 years. He's going to die at 47 years of age. The great encapsulation of his life is there in verse 2. He did what was right, but only as long as Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Jehoiada the priest instructed him as long as he could. He lived to 130 years of age. And then he died and went on to glory. And so as long as that priest was around, he was okay. Jehoash is the kind of man who becomes like whatever situation he's around. He's a chameleon. He's, he becomes whatever the group that's around him is, is like. He's a follower. He's not a leader. And the dangerous thing is, is here is a man who has enormous power. He has enormous position. And yet he's not a leader. He's a follower. He's a follower. He has no character of his own. He's a man who has lived off of the character of another person. And then when that person dies, he has nothing built into his life, nothing that is there, and now he goes his own way when, you know, this virtuous influence goes. And so... Here he's lived under the influence of Jehoiada, but all of that influence for all of those years, it, he never allowed uh, that instruction of Jehoiada to have any kind of a permanent place in his life. He just listened to it. Here's a boy that was raised his first you know, seven years in the temple. Here's a man that was around the things of God for years and years and years, and yet the things of the Lord never penetrated his heart. And the day was going to come when he'd be left on his own and then the feebleness of his spiritual condition would be manifest to all. It is very dangerous to have a spiritual mediator. It's very dangerous to draw my spirituality off of someone else. I need to have my own walk with the Lord. I need to have my own convictions of what is righteous and what is not righteous. I need to have my own convictions about what is holy and what is not holy and what I ought to do and ought not to do, not only in public but in private. And so now when this man is left alone, no longer able to feed off of another person's spirituality, you see it in marriages all of the time, you see it in all kinds of of different relationships, 
he comes as Jehoiada goes and all of a sudden it's manifest before everyone that this guy has absolutely no spiritual reality in his life. And it's revealed by the choices that he makes once he's no longer under a mediator. No longer under someone that stands between him and God and does for him what he ought to only have happening between he and God in that relationship. And what do you do if you're in that place? Best thing that a person can do. And I'll tell you, you can be in church for a lot of years and live off of a lot of other relationships and not be a spiritual person one bit. And then I'm left alone. And when I'm finally left alone and I'm going to make my choices based upon the character or lack of character in my life, I make all of the wrong choices. Why? There's no character in my life. And so what do I do if I'm in that place? Just to fall on my knees and confess my sin to the Lord and say, Lord, I want reality with You. I know how to pray out loud. I can pray for a half hour out loud, Lord. I know how to teach the Word and speak the Word, Lord. I know how to give Bible studies. I know how to say what's right here and spiritually acceptable in this environment and that environment and all. But Lord, you know it's just something I've drained off of everyone else. I'm just a scribe. I'm just a quoter of everyone else's spirituality. To be able to say, Lord, I just I turn from that. And I commit myself to the smallest of steps between you and I as long as those steps mean that there's reality between you and I. I want to pray to you, Lord, like there's reality there. I want to read your Word, Lord, for the first time in my life like you're real and your Word really is what it says it is. That's the place to go when you're in that position. But He's not going to do that. He's going to open his ear up to other voices, other princes to come into his life and to speak to him. I'll tell you, the great revealer of character and what we are and what we are not as it relates to character is what we are when we're alone. Whether that's in my house or halfway on the other side of the world. Because... Character is a settled issue. And I'll be that in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. What we are in private, what we are when we're alone, that's what we really are. And that's why God speaks in the New Testament. Paul writing to the church at Colossae, and he said, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. He said, let it dwell in you not in everyone else around you. Let it dwell in you personally and let it dwell in you richly so that there's an abundance that comes forth and impacts those that are around us. And I'll tell you, it's really a hard thing here that this nation has to go through as it relates to Jehoash. But this is a situation that probably sooner or later, certainly all of us run into it in, our, in the course of our Christian walk. And sometimes this is the hardest place for us as parents, raising our children in the Lord. When they reach those years, those teenage years, and we spend all those years pouring our lives into their lives, and now they're not only teenagers, but they're headed into adulthood. And we all know that the Lord was supposed to be back by now before they ever became teenagers. We had that agreement with the Lord, didn't we? But there's that difficult time where their relationship with the Lord goes from being an extension of ours, where we have that necessary position of mediator as we're training them up as parents to where they reach that point where it's going to be revealed what they really have between them and the Lord. And sometimes that's a lot rockier than than we like it to be as Christian parents. But that it's that place where their relationship is going from being an extension of ours 
to being their own. And sometimes, you know, we think they're way up here in terms of spirituality, and then we find out maybe later on that they're way down here, and their first step is going to be that baby step of saying, all right, I, I know how to play this game. I know, how, I know how to do this. I know how to, to get by in church. But now for the first time in my life, I want to know what reality is. Not just my parents' reality between them and the Lord, but a reality between myself and the Lord. That's a tough place. That's a tough place. Tough place for the parent. It's a tough place for them. But always the way is to go to the Lord and say, Oh Lord, this is what I am. This is what I am. This is what I want to be. Now you take me there. And he'll be faithful to do that. This uh, Jehoash is not going to turn to the ways of the Lord. And you know what he's going to end up doing? We'll see it more completely in Second uh, Chronicles. But he's going to end up killing the son of the priest that raised him. Because he's going to follow after evil. And then Zechariah, Jehoiada's son, is going to rise up and confront him with it. You're following evil. Why are you doing this? Why do you turn away from the favor of the Lord? And then this king is going to have Jehoiada's son stoned to death for speaking the truth in his life. The stakes are enormously high that a proper choice be made. When I come face to face with the fact that I have a relationship that's one of a mediator and the realizing that I need to get my own relationship with the Lord. And a failure to do that, I'll tell you, you, you don't know what, I, I don't know what about you, but I don't know what I'm capable of if my heart is given opportunity for full expression as it relates to evil. You know, the Lord speaks about our hearts as He wrote to Jeremiah. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the Lord answers His question and says, I, the Lord, know it. He knows our hearts well enough that He comes along and says, You obey Me so that your heart doesn't get to express the the depths of its wickedness in in terms of of the flesh. But He did these things that were right as long as the priest was alive. Verse 3, But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. And so the Lord took note of the fact that they didn't go as far as they ought to have gone. And Jehoash said to the priests, all the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man's census money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that a man proposes in his heart, purposes in his heart to bring to the house of the Lord, let the priests take it themselves, each from his constituency, and let them repair the damages of the temple wherever any the lapidation is found. And so, he tells the priest, take the census money in Israel under the law. Every time they had a census, any man that was over 20 years of age, he had to bring a half shekel to the temple. They were to take the uh, assessment money, which was the money that the men would pay to redeem the firstborn, whether it would be a child or whether it would be an animal. And then it was the free will offerings those monies were to be gathered to take and restore the temple, which was now in, in bad repair because of the worship of Baal. And so no money was going into the temple, wasn't being taken care of. This king had lived six formative years in the temple growing up, and he was acutely aware of how much attention it needed. And so one of the first things he does was for that to be restored to its proper condition. Now, it was so by the 23rd year of king, that's a combination of year and king, ying, year, um, in the third year of King Jehoash, Jehoash, that the priests had not repaired the damages of the temple. And so, you know, 23 years, that's a long time to be taking offerings to do something, and uh, there's no progress. And so Jehoash called Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said to them, Why have you not repaired the uh, damages of the temple? Now therefore, don't take any more money from your constituency, but deliver it for repairing the damages of the temple 
And the priests agreed that they would neither receive any more money from the people nor repair the damages of the temple. Listen, if they hadn't made any progress in 23 years, uh, they simply had proved that they weren't able to handle money. And sometimes, you know, um, not all leaders can handle money. And these guys are uh, unable, evidently, to handle it properly because all this money's coming in and um, nothing's happening. I don't know where it was was going, but it wasn't uh, going where it was supposed to. And then Jehoiada the priest took a chest And he bored a hole in its lid, and he set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priests who kept the door put there all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. So as these offerings would come in, they would put it into that chest. And so it was, whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and put it in bags. They counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. So good accountability here. They got one priest handling it, and then the king sends his accountant. And they're going to keep a log of what's come in and what's being processed and and all of that uh, so that a proper record is kept. And then they gave the money which had been apportioned into the hands of those who did the work, who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they paid it out to the carpenters and the builders who worked on the house of the Lord, and to the masons and to the stone cutters. And for buying timber and hewn stone to repair the damage of the house of the Lord and for all that was paid out to repair the temple. However, um, there was not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver, trimmers, sprinkling bowls, trumpets, any articles of gold or articles of silver from the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. So all this money was to go to the restoration of the building itself and not go into the articles that were to be uh, to be fashioned and uh, related to um, the services in the temple. Um, Jehoash would do that. It just didn't come out of this money. Uh, and so, verse 14, <clears throat> But they gave that, gave the money to the workmen, and they repaired the house of the Lord with it. And moreover, they did not require an account from the men into whose hands they delivered the money, to be paid to workmen, for they dealt faithfully. And so here's these construction guys, and uh, they handle the Lord's money better than the priests were handling it. They were faithful in in how they uh, handled that. And the money from the trespass offerings and the money from the sin offerings was not brought into the house of the Lord. It belonged to the priests. That went towards their support. Now, Haziel, the king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it, And so Haziel set his face to go up to Jerusalem. He's, you know, conquered Gath. Now he's going to go against Jerusalem and and attack them and plunder Jerusalem. And what what should Jehoash do? He ought to pray to the Lord. Say, Lord, what do you want me to do here? This guy's attacking me, and I don't have the slightest idea what, what I should do. And Jehoash doesn't pray at all. He took all of the sacred things that his fathers, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and Ahaziah, kings of Judah had dedicated and his own sacred things and all the gold found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and in the king's house. And he sent them to Haziel, king of Syria. And then Haziel went away from Jerusalem. (laughs) That's three generations of wealth gone in one day. Thrown away. The book of Proverbs talks about leaving an inheritance to a fool. And that's exactly what happened. Here these kings worked so so many of these kings godly kings working to preserve you know this these articles for the temple and the gold for the temple and the worship of the Lord and then this guy comes along cares nothing about the things of the Lord and he just gives it all away in order to buy peace you can never buy peace by you know giving a, a wicked person or giving satan what he's asking for in in terms of wealth You never can do that. Peace is found in a right relationship with the Lord. It's found in repenting of my sin and and listening to Him and being in relationship with Him. This guy's trying to buy peace. You never buy peace. Not then, not now. You tell me where is there peace in this world apart from being in a present tense, current relationship with the Lord. Where is there peace? There is no peace. There is no peace. It can't be bought for any price. 
And so he's trying to buy peace, and it only works for a little while. Now, the rest of the acts of uh, Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And his servants arose and made a conspiracy and killed Joash and the house of the Millo, which is down, uh, goes down to Silla, for Jazakar, the son of Shimeath, and Jehozabad, the son of Shomer, his servants, struck him, and so he died, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David, and then Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place. They killed him in, at 47 to avenge the death of the son of of the priest who was killed, Zechariah, that we spoke of earlier. These men took and said, listen, you have killed innocent blood. And so they took and, and, uh, and killed him in that. And the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoiahaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel in Samaria. Now keep all these names straight because we'll have a test at the end of the night. And so now we go... We've been in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now we jump up to the northern kingdom of Israel where we follow, uh, you know, Jehu, the one that, you know, killed and wiped out the descendants of, of uh, Ahab. He's died now and his son now becomes ruler over Israel in Samaria. He reigned 17 years and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He did not depart from them. And then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Haziel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, all their days. Wait a second. Here is Haziel, who Elisha had spoken to and said to him when he had been sent by his master, Ben-Hadad, to find out whether he was going to be healed of his wounds. And Elisha looked at Haziel and said, yes, he's going to recover from his wounds. And then he looked right into Haziel's heart and then spoke about Haziel was going to kill Ben-Hadad and then what he was going to do to the nation of Israel. The interesting thing is that Haziel kills Ben-Hadad and then he names his first son after him. Excuse me, you think that makes it all better? <laughs> That's kind of kooky. You know, what, what men will do to try and ease their conscience, I think I'll name a son after him. It was a bad, it was a bad day. Bad day killed him that day. And so Jehoiahaz pleaded with the Lord in the midst of this affliction by the Syrians, and the Lord listened to him. I mean, it's all the Lord was wanting was someone to talk to him. Someone to cry out to him. And, and so the Lord listened to him, for he saw the uh, oppre uh, oppression of Israel because the king of Syria oppressed them. And then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer so that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin but walked in them, and the wooden images also remained in Samaria. So the Lord just keeps waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for just one man who will come on the scene and say, this is the standard for what God wants in a king and in a man of God, and not what we see around us. That's all he was waiting for. Someone to come and take those two stupid golden calves in the city of Dan and Beersheba that Jeroboam had introduced into the uh, worship in the northern kingdom of Israel. Someone to take them and grind them to powder, cast them out in the desert, and be done with the stupid worship of a cow and, and, and the idolatry of that. And yet, no one would. In this passage, it exhorts my heart to, for me not to accept the standard of what I see around me, even in religious circles, as being the acceptable 
standard. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And it's going to take this being the standard for our lives and then living it in the power of the Holy Spirit by His grace to hear those words. And so he kept mentioning over and over again, this one became the king, but he didn't turn. And then this one became the king, but he didn't turn from that. And then this one became the king, but he didn't turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made all of Israel to sin. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made all of Israel to sin. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made all of Israel to sin. And so even though all of that was firmly entrenched in their history, it was still wrong. It was still wrong. It didn't match the Word of God. Verse 7, For the Lord left of the army of Jehoiahaz only fifty horsemen, ten chariots, and ten thousand foot soldiers, for the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiahaz and all that he did uh, and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And so Jehoiahaz rested with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria And then Joash, his son, reigned in his place. Seventh year of Joash, the different Joash, the southern kingdom of Judah, Joash. The 37th year, the guy that was going to reign 40 years, child king. The 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoiahaz, became king over Israel in Samaria And he reigned 16 years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he did not depart from all of the sins of Jeroboam. Yes, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, but he walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash, and all that he did, and his might with which he fought against Amaziah, son of uh, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And so Joash rested with his fathers, Then Jeroboam sat on his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Elisha, this great man of faith, this man with a double portion of the Holy Spirit, and he's going to die of what he got sick of last. Now, you know, you feel kind of stupid that you even have to make that kind of a point in a sermon. But there's an awful lot of teaching that has been around for many, many years now. I hope it's dying down. This idea that a man or a woman of faith is never going to get sick. I tell you, if you take that to its, you know, take it out a little bit, you, then you say, well, how in the world do these people die that have enough faith you, never to get sick? And they'll tell you, well, um, we just reach a point where we just release our spirit. Really, um, could you document for me how many of you have done that Uh, through history. Because it seems to me that every time I turn around, you guys are struggling for your last breath in hospitals just like everybody else. It's the great dirty little secret of the health and wealth doctrine, the health part of it, that no one with enough faith should ever be sick or have an illness. If you have enough faith, you'll be healed. It's the dirty little secret that these people go into the hospital, but nobody finds out about it. Nobody's honest enough to talk about it. One of the great proponents of this idea that no one with enough faith will ever get sick, you know, recently had a bypass surgery. Never, never saw that announced on the show. Never a mention was made of it. Not a mention of it at all. The failure of the doctrine. One of the great proponents of this particular doctrine has a wife who got cancer, and we don't rejoice in that. 
and ended up needing hospitalization as it related to the treatment of that cancer. And that was kept a secret until it couldn't be kept a secret any longer. And this particular preacher to this day uh, will say that his wife didn't have enough faith not to get the cancer or to be healed from it. And I, and I just look at him and I just, what is he going to do someday when his tent breaks down? And it will break down. Elisha's tent broke down and he was a great man of faith. Well, the person will say, well, you know, we're under a different covenant. That was under the old covenant, Mosaic, uh, you know, covenant. We're under the covenant uh, of grace. We're under the covenant of, of the New Testament. Yeah, but, you know, I still see those that are under this new covenant teaching this doctrine, again, going to the hospital. And I wonder, what do I do? What do I do with the passage when... Paul writes to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, and I haven't had a sufficient um, answer for this. Do write me a letter if you can give me insight uh, on this. Don't write me a 400-page letter. If it's truth, you can get to the point in a paragraph. But I don't understand how it is that Paul writes to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake, and for your frequent infirmities. If his infirmities were caused by a lack of faith in sin, surely the Apostle Paul would confront him with that. Timothy, confess your sin, have some faith, man. You're, you're killing your witness for Christ here with these constant infirmities that you're having. But he doesn't do that. doesn't say that to him at all. He says, go ahead and take a little wine for those constant in, infirmities that you're having. Someone will say, well, there really isn't an answer for that, but the Bible teaches, doesn't it, in Isaiah 53 concerning the Messiah, that by his stripes we are healed. Yes, it does, it does say that. And in the New Testament, that's interpreted for us because once in the New Testament, it is identified or quoted in the context of spiritual healing. And then the other place that it's quoted is in the context of physical healing. So it refers to both. I don't have any, I have no, listen, whatever God is saying, if he tells me to, you know, to stand, stand on my hands and walk to the plaza center, I, I'll, I'll do that. I don't need to defend him from his word, and I'm not afraid of anything that his word teaches. And so, yes, there is that being healed by his stripes. But the interpretation of that passage, again, I have to look at it in light of what Paul told Timothy, and I have to recognize that where the Lord is at work, there's going to be reality there. There's going to be a reality, and I'm convinced that that by His stripes we are healed. I I see myself as healed in a different way from whether I get a, a cold or not. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, he said that because of my position in Christ Jesus as a believer, God already sees me seated in the heavenlies. That's how sure our reservations are. And that's how sure my healing is. And one day I'm going to receive a complete healing when this corruption puts on incorruption and this mortal puts on immortality and I lay this tent down and then I receive in its fullness what has been purchased for me in the stripes of Jesus Christ. That's going to happen. I remember talking with Gail Irwin and listening to him one time. He was involved in a magazine, and he received a letter from a set of parents who had a son that was diabetic. They took a step of faith, and they took their son off of his insulin until that son died in front of their very eyes. And every day the leaders of the church would come down and rebuke the devil, rebuke the unbelief and all of those things. 
And that boy died. And the parents were charged with manslaughter. I mean, it's a, you've put yourself in that position. They, they trusted these leaders. They trusted that doctrine. And they not only had to live with the fact that they killed their son, but now on trial, facing jail sentences for the, for the murder of their son. And they came through the entire experience. And the miracle of miracles is that their faith, they didn't lose their faith in the Lord, but they had to search out what was true in the Bible and what was true about these subjects. And they wrote to Gail and they said to Gail, one of the things that we learned from this is that when the Lord works, you don't have to pretend that He worked. When the Lord works, He works with reality. And when He heals, there'll be a healing. And you won't have to pretend that there's a healing when there isn't a healing. I like the way that Gail put it. So many of these doctrines, you have to test them biblically, first of all, by the Word of God. And then you have to test them by Jesus. You have to test test them by the nature of the Father. How many of us in this room who are parents, if we had one of our children come up to us and say, Dad, would you buy me an ice cream cone? And I look at my son or my daughter. In my case, I look at my daughter and I say, yeah, I'll buy you an ice cream cone, but only after you pretend that you have an ice cream cone all day long. And so my child, everywhere we go through the stores, every place we go, my child is pretending that she has an ice cream. And she's licking that ice cream and she's eating that ice cream and then dealing with the drips, oh boy, you know, and all of that thing. And I'm walking through the store and if anyone looked at my daughter and me and came up and said, what is wrong with your kid? I said, well, I'm having her pretend that she's got an ice cream cone in order that she could earn an ice cream cone from me. You'd look and say, you're the cruelest father I've ever run into. You're crazy to do that to a kid? And if we, being evil as parents, someone would look at us and say, that is so foreign from the heart of a father, how ridiculous to foist that kind of a thing upon God Almighty who desires to give good gifts to His children. And when He gives it, We know we have it. There's no pretending. It's gotten stupid in the body of Christ on some of this stuff. It is idiotic. It's more idiotic inside the ark than it is outside of the ark. But it's only the flood outside that causes us to endure the stink inside. It's nutty. It's nutty. It's just nutty, nutty, nutty. Got that off my chest. It's crazy. And nothing is taken back where we see that it's a representation of God, who He is, His nature, and how He's being represented in this day and in this hour. He died of what He got sick of last, like most of us will, if the Lord doesn't return before that time, and we hope that He does. And then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him in his sickness and he wept over his face and he said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Here he recognizes that the strength of the nation was not their weaponry, not their chariots. It took getting down, you know, to uh, 50,000 uh, soldiers there or whatever they had, 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, 10,000 horsemen that's, uh, or soldiers. And that's what it took getting down to for him to finally realize that the strength of that nation was not their military. Their strength was in their prophets. And the number of men and women who were left within that nation who still had an interest in talking to God and listening to God and then speaking what God spoke to them. You wonder how many are left in our day and in our age and in our nation. And so he said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha said to them, take a, to him, take a bow and some arrows. For he, so he took himself a bow and some arrows. And then Elisha said to the king of Israel, 
put your hand on the bow. And so he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hands on the king's hands, and he said, open the east window. That is the lattice that was over the window. They didn't have windows like we have, the opening. And he opened up the area, and then Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And then Elisha said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike uh, the Syrians at Aphek until you have destroyed them. And so it was, and that was the means of declaring war on another nation is when you shot an arrow as a leader into their land or towards their land. And they understood that to mean war. And then they would gather their armies. Now, he doesn't, as he looks out to the east and shoots that arrow, he's not shooting it towards Syria. He's shooting it towards the area that the Syrians have taken within the northern kingdom of Israel, saying, declaring war on them for having taken that land. And so the arrow is shot. And then Elisha says to this king, Joash, and he said, take the arrows. And so he took them. And he said to the king, of Israel strike the ground and so the king of Israel struck the ground three times and then he stopped and the man of God was angry with him and said you should have struck five or six times then you would have struck Israel uh, Syria till you had destroyed it but now you will strike Syria only three times he speaks to this king And here's this king in the midst. The nation is, the northern king, it's gone. It's, it's gone. It's dying. It's, it's dead. It's just going to be taken captive ultimately by the Assyrians. And here in the desperateness of that time in history, here Elisha tells him, take those arrows and strike the ground. And he ought to have taken those areas, arrows, and he ought to have beat the ground until Elisha stopped him from beating the ground. Instead, he takes the arrows and he hits the ground three times. No passion, no fire, no heart for the things of the Lord. That had to be so frustrating for Elisha because here he is, a man who is dying. He's an old man now. His physical body is a shell. But inside who he is, he's a giant. He's a spiritual giant. His bones are filled with fire, filled with zeal for the things of the Lord. And he no longer has a physical body that can express the zeal that's inside of him. And he looks at this young man who has the physical body to do something great for God, and yet there's no zeal in him. There's no passion. There's no fire. He's told to strike the ground, and it's just it, like it, it's like nothing to him. And the passage speaks to us, and it asks us, in the light of this age that the Lord has called us to be a witness to Him. If Elisha says to you tonight, God's given you the victory in a particular area. You play a strategic place in the plans of the Lord in this day. It may not be taking Syria. It it may be taking Memorial Hospital. But God's given us a strategic place. And He gives us a promise with the shooting of the arrow that there's going to be victory in that. And then with that news of victory, He then tells us, now strike the arrows to the ground. I tell you, I think that there's so many Christians who take the arrows and before they could hit the ground, they'd, they'd be asleep. They put the arrows down and where's that remote thing? So how many times will we strike the ground? What kind of zeal's in my heart? The things of the Lord. That's what we keep coming back to in the passage. Jesus speaking to the church of Laodicea. A church that thought they were all hot, but they were lukewarm. 
Jesus said, you know, you guys think you're rich and you think you're this and you think you're that, all these things. He said, that's because you only look at yourself spiritually as he, or physically as he speaks to that church. You're coming to conclusions about your spirituality based upon your wealth. That's another problem with the health and wealth thing. He says, the problem is that so you're so consumed with that that I'm on the outside knocking on the door trying to get into this church. And then he says to that church, he says, I would that you are hot or cold. But he said, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. That's just a nice King James English way of saying vomit, because that's what he says. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That lukewarmness that makes a person sick. And the Lord looks, and in this passage, and as he speaks concerning the condition of the church in the last days, visual church in the last days represented by Laodicea. He's going to look at it and he says, there's no fire. There's no zeal. There's no emotion. There's no passion for the things of me. So what about our hearts tonight? It's hard to have passion. I've been here for an hour already listening to you, Pastor Damien. Beyond that, in my own life, is there a passion for the things of God? Or am I lukewarm as it relates to those things? I couldn't care less about God's plan or that it's accomplished in these days. That's the condition of Joash here. And the prophet was angry over that condition of this particular king who had such opportunity. I bet he thought to himself, Oh, if I could just have your body and use it, I'd have beat that ground with the arrows until we ended on the other side of the world. And then Elisha died and they buried him. And then lest anyone think that he died because he lacked faith or the disfavor of God, and a raiding band from, the Mo- from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year, and so it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. There was nothing wrong with Elisha. He left quite a a legacy. Um, Is my life going to be a life? that if the Lord tarries and He takes us one by one to be with Him, will there be anyone that comes to our bedside and says, Oh, the chariots of Israel. Will anyone care that we've died? Will anyone recognize that there's a loss in, in our moving on? And will we leave a legacy, not of people being dropped down onto our bones and being given life, but leaving a legacy, leaving something behind that generation behind us would come into contact with and and there would be life because of it. That spirit of Elisha and the Hazael king of Syria oppressed Israel all of the days of Jehoiahaz, but the Lord was gracious to them, had compassion on them, and regarded them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not yet destroy them or cast them from his presence. Now Haziel, king of Syria, died, and then Ben-Hadad III, his son, reigned in his place, and Jehoash, the son of Jehoiahaz, recaptured from the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoiahaz, his father by war. Three times Joash defeated him and recaptured the cities of Israel. There were the three victories that God had promised he had desired to do much more, but this man had no zeal for it, and so there was no victory forthcoming.